the sense that there may be convergences that happen. Uh, it's only set as 18 because of uh, the existing uh, configuration. Now, uh, the reason why there's no Article 10 or uh, uh, an article on local governments is because local governments are now under the federated regions. So, uh, but they are, <clears throat> in, in other words, uh, what is proposed is that you don't do anything with the current local government units. So, ang nire-reform mo lang yung upper half lang. Kasi nga, yung uh, disruption ina-avoid mo. Why was, the, why was there a need to have a separate ordinance? But na lang pinasok dito sa Article 11, for instance? Uh, this is more of a question of form and style, uh, Senator. And the Does the federated region have the power to abolish the constituent local government units? Because Art Section 1 seems to hint so. Congress may by law, blah, 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 determine their constituent political subdivisions. Yes, Senator, but uh, this will have to uh, go through the usual process of uh, plebiscite. Pwede nga abolish si governor, si province, si mayor, pwede yun? Pwede, pwede. Okay. It says that the Federal Republic shall consist of 16 federated regions, and it also says that regions are permanent and indissoluble. But it also says that Congress can abolish and merge regions. So parang there's a seeming conflict. What, what is the governing rule there? Indissoluble. You can govern and, and dissolve, but they are permanent and indissoluble. Well... As a national uh, configuration, it's uh, something that's permanent. In other words, the uh, federated region is considered uh, uh, a, a permanent tier of, uh, of government, uh, but the composition of which can be modified. In other words, what's envisioned here really is uh, a way to amalgamate the currently fragmented local government uh, uh, units. But I think there's still a, you know, a bit of a conflict because the federal, it enshrines that they have 16 federated regions, but then you can create regions. So, hindi na 16 yun. <laughs> Yung creation ng regions sa Senator is not creation uh, more than the 18 regions, but may convergences nga. As it is right now, in fact. So, if you create, you have to destroy, you have to dissolve. That's, is, that, is that it? Merge. Okay. So, you're limited by the number. That's right. Okay. Uh, regarding the jurisdiction, again, between the regional governments and the LGUs, the taxing powers are given to the, what if the regional government does not abolish the provinces, the cities, the municipalities? They, under the local government code, by the way, before that, is the local government code perceived to be subsisting under this constitution? Yes, unless we okay, by because the local government code gives them taxing powers, which are listed also in the constitution. Mm -hmm. So you tulad like ng real estate taxation. That's given to cities and municipalities. Yes. Eh, nakalagay dito, no double taxation. Ano mangyayari dyan? Kung may federation, tapos meron ka rin uh, city uh, or municipal taxes. Buti Who, which will govern? Yan, buti na tanong mo yan, Senator, kasi nabanggit ni uh, Dr. Manasan yan. In fact, kaya walang uh, nabanggit doon na business, uh, licensing and taxes. Niretain yan sa local government. So yung current taxing powers ng LGUs, hindi yun ginalaw. Ang ginawa lang, nagbaba lang sa federated regions ng additional ng taxes na originally nasa national. No? Taxes and fees ang binaba sa federated region. Pero yung, uh, yung uh, taxes na, na nasa LGU, katulad ng real property tax, kanila pa din yun. But there is nothing in the constitution which says that the region and the, the city cannot concurrently levy the real property tax. Well, instance. that will have to be subject of their uh, legislation, uh, Senator. That's Kasi why... double taxation yun, di ba? Hindi, kaya nga po, uh, explain ko muna. Kaya nga po ang uh, configuration <coughs> ng federated region, collegial, para, kumbaga, ang, uh, ang iniisip dito, kung magdi-decision sila, kung anong gagawin nila sa current LGU nila, pag-uusapan nila as a uh, collegial body. Again, kahit pag-usapan, kung hindi magkaisa, there's still nothing in law which prevents them from imposing. Unless the provision for double taxation applies to all relationships between the federal and the regional government, between the federal and the LGU, unless that provision is meant to apply whole scale, no? or, or uh, applies, wholesale. Applies to all senators. So, uh, so madit sabi, in, kung uh, kukunin ng federated region yon by way of uh, regional uh, legislation, eh, sila na lang ang mangungulekta nun, hindi na ang local. Okay, maybe that needs to be made clear. Thank you, uh, Professor. How about the power to give incentives? Because I noticed that the power to create economic zones has been given to uh, the federal regions. 
But a crucial power of economic zones is the power to grant incentives. So see, kanina yon, and the power to grant incentives usually, usually involves income tax holidays if you look around the world. Uh, so san, san, what, what is the breadth uh, of, of that power with respect to the federated governments? Essentially, yung economic uh, power kasi, Senator, eh, shared yan talaga sa uh, both levels. So, sa pagkakatanda ko doon sa draft namin, yung incentives nasa Congress. So, still remains with Congress. That's right. Hindi pa maganda i-delegate yun sa mga regions. Kasi, so, you can waive certain uh, uh, to attract, di ba? To also, it's a race to the top in the sense because regions can compete among themselves to attract foreign investment or domestic investment. Even. Of course, that can be considered, Senator. Pero meron din kaming kulatilya dyan na yung existing powers na exclusive, alimbawa, sa federal government, by law later, pwedeng ibaba ng federal government sa federated regions. Okay. How about uh, itong development of natural resources? Uh, there is a proviso which says that the power shall be joint shared by the national and the regional governments or the federal governments. What happens to things like municipal waters, for instance, which, which have been set aside for small-scale fishermen? I think uh, it will have to be part of the intergovernmental relations, uh, Senator. So pag may question, iba to na lang sa intergovernmental. That's right. There's a, there's a body that's created there, the Federal Intergovernmental uh, Commission. Okay. And there is a provision on marine wealth, uh, which is a reiteration of the 1987 Constitution, that mm -hmm. the enjoyment shall be exclusively for Filipinos. Mm -hmm. Does this prevent us from entering joint ventures with the uh, foreign countries? Because I think the reality now is we really don't have the technology to uh, fully exploit our, uh, our marine wealth for our Filipinos. So that's the, that's the catch-22 we are in. You know? we, want to, we want it to be enjoyed exclusively by our countrymen, yet we do not have the wherewithal to really fully... Uh, exploit it, Your Honor. Uh, I think, Senator, that has to be uh, subject to the agreements of uh, countries in, uh, in the uh, eventuality that uh, such uh, opportunity happens. Hindi nga eh. How can it be entered into a joint venture kung pin-event nyo na eh? That's why I want to clear it up. The... Senator, yes, the draft constitution does not uh, contain a prohibition. So, hindi bawal mag joint venture. Okay, that's an important, uh, I think that's an important and actual, there's an actual uh, problem there that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Justice Natura. Um, how about Senator the. Senator Angara, please wrap up. I, I'll ask my, uh, is it okay to ask two more please, questions? Please uh, go ahead. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, what do the local governments get by way of ERA? Because right now, the local government code gives them 40% to be divided up. But uh, the, the new constitution draft, which I think has many good things, and I commend the, obviously, pinag-isipan, pinagtrabahuan ho ito, Justice Puno. I commend your group for, uh, uh, you really tried to uh, search for solutions to real-world problems. No, We're just trying to supplement the, the, the good efforts done. Uh, yun nga. Ano mangyayari? Kasi nakalagay dito 50% yung mapupunta sa federation. So, subsumed na ba doon yung makukuha ng mga cities and provinces? At paano naman yung hatian nun? Kasama na yun uh, doon, uh, Senator. Actually, ang in-envision kasi dyan, hindi naman kasi automatic na pag uh, naglagay ka ng taxing power sa federated region, eh, automatic it can uh, collect it. Kasi yung tax administration has to be reconfigured in time. No? But uh, the era, uh, the idea there is uh, you don't touch the current uh, setup at the local government level, precisely because of the principle of avoiding uh, too much disruptions. Now, if the question is if there will be additional uh, uh, fiscal incentives, there is, but indirectly through the federated regions. That's why, again, it is designed as a way to amalgamate uh, local government units. So if there will be additional uh, uh, entitlements, that will have to be decided by the federated region. No, I don't think you addressed the question. Eh, kasi yung sharing. Eh. So you're, I'm, I'm trying to interpret your answer. You're saying hindi gagalawin yung 40% ng yes. LGUs. That's so right. in effect, 10% na lang ang mapupunta sa federated region. Well, kung ang uh, pinag-uusapan natin dito, yung current computation ng uh, ERA, yeah. hindi siya nag amount talaga sa 40%. Well, uh, with the Mandana's decision, it will, di ba? Uh, hindi pa naman yeah. na final yun, uh, Senator. But that's the, I think uh, we all agree that that's the 
That's the intent of the local government code. That's right. But uh, in the deliberations of the CONCOM, we made sure our basis is the existing uh, setup. We did not anticipate the Mandana's decision. Ang problema dito, uh, I hope this is not counted as a question. No? I'd like to spread it in the record. Kasi kung mag yung regional government at saka yung mga local government units, mm -hmm. dun sa entitlements nila, what happens? Who, who, is, who will determine their share that they're entitled to? That's, that's all I want. I don't need a definitive answer. I'm just pointing out that that's something that will crop up in the future and you must address it. No? Uh, okay, my last question, uh, Sir Chair, kahit malap, mahal, marami pa huto, but uh, uh, is, there, is the President or the Vice President, they're only entitled to one re-election under the provision. Mm -hmm. But there is that question raised when uh, President Estrada ran again after stepping down. So are they entitled to run again after a break of four years? Uh, Senator, there is no provision to that effect in the draft constitution. I would like to believe that the intention of the members of the commission was to make, to limit the president's term to only two, two and only two at any given la part of his life. So, hanggang dalawa lang, yun ang, I think, that is the intention. At least that was how I understood it when I voted for the provision. Yeah, but I think it should be made clear. Otherwise, you will have, uh, again, that question cropping up. It's a real question, Your Honors. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Angara. Uh, Senator Gachalian, you have the floor. You have three minutes. Please proceed. Thank, thank you, Senator uh, Kiko. I just have one question, Senator Kiko. And I've been um, conferring uh, with my um, seatmate, Senator Bam, about the... Uh, the structure of the Senate in the proposed uh, charter. Um, galing po ako sa Congress, no, kami po ni Senator Sani, and we saw the dynamics of how congressmen um, decides on a certain matter. No? And since they're elected locally, uh, the priority really is to bring home the bacon to your locality. No? And um, now that I'm in the Senate, um, nakita ko rin ho yung dynamics ho dito. And collectively, I think the Senate acts like balancing power to the president as a whole because we have the same constituency. Now, reducing the Senate to um, two per regions effectively is reducing the Senate to a parochial type of setting. So, magiging, of course, pag regional na po ang setup ng Senado, ang priority ho namin will be bringing home the bacon to our regions. No? Um, a answer of the national issue will not even discuss about issues in Mindanao, uh, laws that can affect our nation will be, I guess, will be not the priority because the priority will be what's important for our region. Now, the balancing power also, because we're now elected locally, uh, will also be affected because we cannot balance the, the president or the vice president for that matter because our constituency is now widely different. Uh, I, I just want to throw this to the body and, 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 and anyone can answer this. How can we now, in the new proposed charter, how can we now assure the balance of power if the Senate is now reduced to a regional constituency? Uh, it becomes a parochial uh, constituency, just like the, the congressmen. No? Um, sa Congress, ho, um, basta meron hong uuwi tayo sa constituency, madali hong mag-decide. No? Um, dito sa Senate, wala ang constituency ho natin nationwide eh. So, the, 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 the decision-making process here is widely, no, alayo ho, no, compared to a, to a congressman or a locally elected official. So, how do we now assure that balance of power between the president and the legislature? And anyway, I can... Senator Richelian, first of all, um, the example of the U.S. will show that your fears may not be totally founded. I mean, the senators in the U.S. are elected by states. In other words, it's the function of the office that will determine how these uh, senators are expected to react, meaning to say the power to enact national legislation will still be in the hands of the senators. So. Uh, uh, the advantage of electing them uh, by region 
federated region is the fact that look at our uh, experience uh, under the present system where the senators are elected at large. In the last elections alone, only one outside of Luzon from the Visayas was elected, and that is Franklin Drillon. All the rest, the, uh, Luzon. In other words, uh, the present composition of the Senate, 24 senators, 19 are from Luzon. One is from the Visayas. Uh, there are three others. Uh, Simig Subiri from Mindanao, and then si Manny Pacquiao from Kuala Lumpur, or whatever it is now. <laughs> and then the third one, of course, is uh, Coco Pimentel. I don't know if you know him, but he's also from Mindanao. What I'm trying to say is that unless we uh, enable uh, the uh, senators to be elected by federated regions, the uh, uh, the feelings of discrimination, especially by the Muslim peoples, will continue. Because no matter how good the candidate of a Muslim uh, uh, region now, if it's done nationally, and even in Alo, with so many problems, uh, you know, affecting the Philippines, uh, being blamed on the insurgency of the Muslims in uh, parts of Mindanao. And therefore, uh, Senator William, uh, I mean, when I, I am really suggesting that uh, we elect the senators by federal states, and this will not detract from their uh, doing their work, provided that their work is defined by national law. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, time, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick statement, Mr. Chair. I, am I, 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 my, my, no, my, my fear um, in this setup is the Senate elected regionally will take the character of a district congressman or a district um, uh, position. And um, the, the, the motivation of a regionally elected senator will now become uh, reduced to its parochial interest. So kung gusto niya manalo, no, as long as magdadala siya ng project sa district niya, Eh, or sa region niya, no, yung po ang magiging decision-making pattern niya or decision-making uh, process niya. Um, in the national setting, which I, kasi galing po ako from local to national, there's no constituency. Your constituency is the entire Philippines. No? And in fact, uh, you take the um, the uh, cudgels of your entire, of the entire nation and you try to understand the intricacies of the different regions. But the most important here is it becomes your constituency, the constituency of the president, is the same. No? So pareho kayong pinag-iikutan at pareho kayong kinakausap. And my fear lang here is if you are reduced to, to a region, no? ang incentive mo or motivation mo is alagaan lang region mo, not alagaan yung entire nation. So um, this can be discussed, Chair, Mr. Chair, as we go along, I just want to spread this into the records and express my uh, sentiments towards this setup, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Chief Justice Puno, please proceed. Yes, sir. <coughs> may respond. Uh, just a uh, brief uh, rejoinder. And uh, I would just like to uh, underscore the uh, intent of uh, the consultative uh, committee when uh, it uh, provided that uh, senators should be elected by region. The, uh, the only uh, intent in uh, doing this is to follow the principle of uh, equalizing the unequal. And that is the uh, principle followed in the United States, where uh, all these states, especially the small states, are uh, given that, uh, that uh, privilege, if not uh, a right, to be represented in uh, the Senate. And so, in uh, our uh, particular uh, geographical uh, setting, we, we also uh, see this uh, particular evil uh, happening, where uh, our uh, brethren from uh, Mindanao or uh, the Visayas are underrepresented 
or wars unrepresented in the Senate. In other words, uh, they were, they stood in an equal footing with the others. And so in order to uh, address that uh, particular uh, political uh, evil, we put in this uh, uh, regional election by, uh, by uh, of our senators. And uh, given that uh, kind of uh, intention, there is no, there, is, there should be no reading at all that we are diminishing the national perspective of uh, the senators when they are enacting laws. Thank you. Uh, yes. Senator Baum? Very, very briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman. But siguro just to respond to Chief Justice Puno, the reverse is also true, uh, Chief Justice, which is that maybe not all of us come from uh, specific areas in the country, obviously, but I think the Senate has been able to tackle these national issues, even if you don't come from that area. No? For example, yesterday we had the hearing on Boracay, the closure of Boracay. Who are the senators present? Trillanes from Bicol, Binay from Makati, and Aquino from Tarlac. So e e even if none of us actually came from uh, or, or hailed from the Visayas, because of our national mandate, we are compelled to address the issues of those who were displaced in Boracay. So, Pedro, who, I guess this is something we'll have to discuss, no? If, if the time does come, then it will be further discussed. But I think some of us just want to put on record, or maybe Senator Wynn and I just want to put on record, that the senators, even Senator Gatchalan from NCR, but the concerns that he tackles are nationwide. And same with the rest of the senators here as well. No? Thank you, uh, Thank Mr. you, Chief Senator Justice. Baum. We now go back to our resource persons. Uh, Chief Justice Davide, you have the floor now for your uh, comments on the draft charter. Thank you, uh, Your Honors. The headline of yesterday's issue of the Philippine Daily Inquirer is Pacquiao victory unites nation anew. What a blessing that such a victory unites again our people. But that unity is temporary. The unity of our people that can last even beyond our generation is unity in harmony, peace and prosperity under one nation, one heart, one soul. That is the unity we can achieve by now stopping the cha-cha train. Let us now stop its noise, which has divided our people and which, uh, if allowed, uh, its course will divide our nation into 18 federated regions. Let us deliver a mortal blow to charter change, just as what Senator Pacquiao did to Lucas Matisse. The, I express my profound gratitude uh, to you, Senator Pangilinan, for inviting me to this public hearing. This would actually be my third before uh, under your chairmanship. The first was last January 17, here in the Senate. And the second was last March 1 at the Cebu Provincial Capital. Also on February 22, 2017, with Senator Frank Trilona chair, I appeared before this committee. In both the February 22, 2017 and January 17, 2018 public hearings, I expressed my stand that our present constitution does not need any amendment or revision and no valid, strong and compelling reason exists to warrant any amendment or revision. If at all there will be uh, such a need, it should be proposed by a constitutional convention composed of members duly elected by the people in a non-partisan election. At the January 17 hearing, no less than retired Chief Justice Puno, former Senate President Nene Pimentel, former uh, 1986 uh, Constitutional Commission uh, Commissioners, Florenger Braid, Adolfo Ascuna and Edmundo Garcia also expressed their preference for a concon. They also expressed the view that if there would be a constituent assembly or CONAS, the Senate and the House of Representatives should vote separately. It was reported after that hearing that the Senate decided that if there would be a CONAS, the Senate will vote separately. At the public hearings on January 17 and March 1, I also declared that the shift to federalism is a lethal experiment, a fatal leap, a plunge to death, and a leap to hell. 
This afternoon, I reiterate my stand and the reasons in support thereof. I request the committee to consider as part of my presentation this afternoon the stand and reasons I had presented in the previous hearings. I understand from the letter of invitation uh, of our committee secretary, Horace Akruda, that the main focus of this public hearing would be the draft of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of the Philippines prepared and then approved on 3 July 2018 by the Constitutional Committee created by the President and headed by retired Chief Justice Puno. The committee formally submitted the draft to the President on July 9. Despite my efforts to immediately get a copy of the draft constitution, it was only last Tuesday, July 10, that I got one. Last Sunday, Mr. Kruda emailed to me a copy of the constitution approved by the Cons Consultative Committee, which for convenience I shall hereafter refer to as the CCCOM. I will not consider this as a CONCOM uh, constitution. Uh, there might be confusion between the CONCOM 1986 and the CONCOM uh, created by the President. Uh, that was the statement of Mr. Enroso. Um, it consists of 82 pages in short band paper, single space, and in very fine print. It has 22 articles. Our present constitution has 18 articles. The earlier one I received is printed in 101 pages, legal size band paper, in single space, and in small letter that I could hardly uh, uh, read the same because I had just my cataract operation at the time. This con CC com would be three or four times longer yet once two ordinances uh, would be appended to it. These are not attached to the copies that we have now. These ordinances are one, that covering the apportionment of the federated regions, and two, the Banco Moro Organic Act, signed by the President and duly ratified by the people in the areas concerned. I had spoken about the CCCOM at the Binyal Regional Convention of Lawyers of the IBP Southern Luzon Region last Friday, 13 July. I told them about the good and the bad of it. Your Honours, there may be no more need for the Senate and the House of Representatives to consider any further charter change, especially on the shift to federalism. As reported, the Supreme Court and Bank had effectively delivered a mortal blow, a coup de grace, on federalism by demolishing or striking out the principal reason given by its proponents for its adoption. What is the principal reason? Removing Imperial Manila and recognizing the right the LGUs to a genuine share in national funds and resources. The court ruled that the 40 percent era for the LGU, L LGUs shall be based on all national taxes, not only on internal revenue taxes. That mortal blow is again like the mortal blow of Pacquiao on Lucas. Thanks to the Supreme Court. Probably at this time we should thank the Supreme Court. The LGUs can now collect their shares in all the national taxes from 1992 upon the effectivity of the local government code. According to Secretary Carlos Dominguez of uh, the Department of Finance, as reported in yesterday's issue of the Philippine Star, that is the business section, page P1, under the decision, the amount owed by the national government to the LGUs effective 1992 until the present would reach to 1.5 trillion pesos. The cha-cha train can now permanently stop. Yet, uh, it must still be necessary that we should inform our people that the charter change and federa federalism proposed in the CCCOM would not bring them the manna from heaven, but tyranny, injustice, corruption, poverty, and penury. I am now more than convinced that if the administration should really want federalism as conceived by the Consultative Committee, 
that change and all others as now incorporated in this ECOM must be done in a constitutional convention composed of the delegates I mentioned earlier, elected in an partisan election and required to submit to the COMELEC their own constitutional reform proposals together with their certificates of candidacy. In this regard, then, Your Honours, I suggest that the committee now submit a special report uh, on the resolution of Honorable Senator Frank Grillon, RBH number one, entitled Resolution calling for a constitutional, for a convention to propose amendments to the revision of the Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines, which the Senate shall do so in the morning of Monday, July 23, 2018, upon the opening of its third regular session of the 17th Congress. This is of vital importance because many things cannot be hardly concocted by pro-federalism proponents before the president's honor. The president might bring a copy of the CCCOM, which the committee submitted to him on July 9, and announced in the course of his honor that he would want it acted upon in the Congress. Let us be unceasing our prayer to Almighty God that he should not and instead announce that there would be no chatsa during his term as president. Let me now explain a little more on the CCCOM and why it should be referred to a con, -con not to a con -us. We were made to believe that the principal task of the consultative committee was to focus on federalism and that it shall recommend a new constitution work out in a manner that would be strictly for a federal system. If we may recall, on the inaugural session of the committee, the Chairman Chief Justice Puno exhorted and urged the members to devote a serious thought on the open code, architectural design, close code, of a federal system, open code, distinctly Filipino, close code. That's Manila Bulletin, 20 February 2018. Since it is to be open quote distinctly Filipino plus quote, it could have been there could have been no model as such as the federal system in various countries, the United States, Germany, Canada, and the Russian Federation. If you recall, even the president mentioned a hybrid federalism like that he said of China and Hong Kong. But what the consultative committee produced is not just a federal republic of the Philippines, through the division, breaking up or splitting of the one single nation, the Philippines, into 18 federated regions composed of the 16 administrative regions and the autonomous regions and the Cordillera Autonomous Region, with provisions that would strictly adhere to the traditional federal setup. It overhauled the 1987 Constitution through massive restructuring or surgery and incorporating principles, concepts, etc., etc., which may be foreign to the federal system and even erect a weak democracy, made weaker yet by some undemocratic ingredients spiced with some elements of fascism and totalitarianism. Three provisions build or support a dictatorship. The first consists of one whole article, Article 12, of transitory provisions. This article in the CC home that I got, and even in that email to me by Mr. Cruda last Sunday, establishes a federal transition commission. It is to be composed of the president himself, as the chairman, and then others appointed by the president from a list of personalities submitted by a search committee. But the members of the search committee are themselves appointed by the president. Among others, the commission is empowered to organize and reorganize and fully establish the federal government and the governments of the federated regions. It shall prepare a transition plan, which, among others, 
can remove all in the government service, thereby violating the security of tenure guarantee of all government officials and employees. Section 8 of the transitory provisions provides all officials of the government under the 1987 Constitution shall continue to hold their office and exercise their responsive power, respective powers and continue to hold on uh, or to hold to their office and exercise their respective powers and duties under such terms and conditions as may be provided in the transition plan. The incumbent president, as chairman of the Federal Transition Commission, can hold on to power with absolute control of the government and all its branches, not just the executive department. While it is true that Section 6 of the transitory provisions provides that open code, the term of the president and the vice president shall end on June 30, 2022, close code, which is an unnecessary provision for, in fact, they were elected for the term ending 30 June 2022 under the 1987 Constitution. Nothing can prevent the president to run for president in the first election under the new Constitution of the Federal Republic of the Philippines. The new term under it is not re-election under the 1987 Constitution, which is already prohibited under it. The one against re-election will no longer apply to one running under the new Constitution. Even if the President would pledge that he would not run, he cannot say no if allowed to. That is the voice of the people. To my great surprise, Your Honours, at 2.53 o'clock yesterday afternoon, our committee secretary, Mr. Gruda, emailed to me what he called as the latest version of the draft of the CCCOM, which was provided to him by the consultative committee about half an hour earlier. That is 2.23 o'clock yesterday afternoon. This new draft is in 107 pages of short band paper written in single space in very, very fine font. I have to use a magnifying glass. I noted that Article 12 on transitory provisions was completely revised to principally remove the vigorously criticized provisions that would allow the incumbent president to prolong himself in power and thus be a dictator by running for president in the May 2022 elections. As thus revised, Section 2 of the transitory provisions now provides oh, the incumbent president is prohibited from running as president in the 2022 election and uh, the vice president under, under the constitution. But what complicates the situation is that while section 1 of the article expressly provides that the term of the president and the vice president shall end on 30 June 2022, which shall not be extended, there will be an election for the transition president and transition vice president who shall run in tandem. No, in tandem. The word in tandem is now being constitutionalized on a date that depends on when the CCC home will be ratified by the people. It would be held six months after ratification, which is presumed to be some years before 2022. It will thus obviously follow that after the ratification and before 30 June 2022, we will have two presidents. The incumbent will serve until 30 June 2022, and the transition president, if he will not be the incumbent, who will serve until the end of the transition, with the transition president exercising all the powers of the president under the 1987 Constitution. The catch here is uh, that the incumbent president is not prohibited from running as transition president. To avoid, therefore, the anomaly of having two presidents and vice presidents during the transition period, the incumbent is allowed to run as transition president, but not for president under the new federal constitution. He will surely win. I have no doubt about it. He would choose former Bongbong Marcos as running mate, and since they would run in tandem, 
with the vote for the president counted in favor of the vice president, Marcos will easily win. Then the incumbent president will become the first president of the federal system, and Marcos, too, the first vice president. Then in the first election under the federal system, if there, is, if there be any change in the proposal, Marcos can run for president, while then hold election from transition president and transition vice president. Considering the powers of the transition president, it would still not be unlikely that the transition plan and his power could make him rule beyond 30 June 2022. There is still another provision, Your Honors, in the proposed constitution that gives the president control of the federated regions. Section 16 of Article 19 on national security and public order gives him the power to intervene and take all the measures necessary and proper in case any federated region fails to comply with its obligation as provided for in the Constitution, which seriously undermines the sovereignty, territorial integrity, economy, or the unity of the Federal Republic. The reality of this dictatorial rule is further bolstered by adopting lawless violence as a ground for the declaration of martial law. Under the present Constitution, Article 8, uh, Article 7, Section 18, there are only two grounds, invasion and rebellion. Section 18, Paragraph 6 of Article 8, of CCCOM. The grounds are invasion, rebellion, or lawless violence. The president can easily justify lawless violence at any time. The third undemocratic provision is the total perpetual deprivation of the people to amend or revise the Constitution in respect of open code, the democratic and republican character of the government in a federal structure, it's in the solubility and permanence, that is section four of article 21. In the language of the section, this shall not be subject to amendment or revision. Where is now the underlying principle that in a democratic and republican state, sovereignty resides in the people and all government authorities emanates from the people, section 9 of article 2 of the present constitution. We should probably be reminded of what George Washington said in his farewell address in 1796. Open quote, the basis for our political systems is the right of the people to make and to alter their constitutions of government, close quote. The CCCOM is anti-Filipino. First, it adopts a system of government that is not suited for the Philippines and the Filipino people and has never been tried and tested in our country and is involved in an anomalous violation of how federal states and governments are evolved. Second, while Article 2 on national territory takes the trouble to expand the territory by its long definition, it deliberately did not mention by name the West Philippine Sea. Yet, it specifically mentions by name the Philippine rice, which is the Benham rice. Why not clearly and specifically mention the West Philippine Sea? Because uh, uh, probably the administration's fear of or love for China I have earlier mentioned of the Philippines becoming a province or colony of China. But let me elaborate further. If you recall, in a gathering of Chinese businessmen on 19 February 2018 at the Manila Hotel, the president mentioned of the Philippines being a province of China. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque tried to question the impact of the president's statement by saying that it was only a president's joke. But we know for historic fact that China does not consider serious pronouncements as jokes 
especially if it is in our favor. We know too that Chinese leaders, especially its president now, President Xi, whom our president admires much, do not joke on state affairs or, ma or matters. I've spoken of several indicators where the Philippines is getting closer to be a colony or province of China. Just consider a few. First, almost twice weekly, our national broadsheets put in one or two full-page ads pictures of Chinese presidency as showcasing his programs and the success of China, Chinese leadership. Two, it was reported that just recently, on two occasions, a Chinese military plane landed in Davao City. Three, China has reclaimed parts of our West Philippine Sea. Four, the president has already visited China and met uh, President Xi thrice. Five, the palace had mentioned of China-Philippines co-ownership of the West Philippine Sea. Six, in one of the president's visits to China, China provided a 3.8 billion assistance to the Philippines and the construction for free up to bridges uh, over the Pasig River. Seven, a few days after the president's trip to China, Chinese military aircrafts landed at our Panganiban Reef in our West Philippine Sea. Eight, China unveiled a monument to the island building in the West Philippine Sea. Nine, China has deployed missiles on the Panganiban, Samora, and Kagitingan Reefs in the West Philippine Sea. Ten, after his last trip to China, the president made an offer of a 60-40 sharing with China for the joint exploration plan, exploration plan for the West Philippine Sea. 11. And to our shock, the front page of the Manila Bulletin issue of 6 July 2018 has this title, President to seek China's help if war breaks out in Mindanao. The CCCOM is anti-people. Consider its declaration of principles alone. It does not contain anymore the guarantee of, open quote, full respect for human rights, close quote, enshrined in Section 11 of Article 2 of our present Constitution. While this is a contrast to expand the Bill of Rights, Article 3, by stressing that the rights enumerated therein are now demandable against the state, and on state actors, it forgot that it has provided in Section 3 of its Article 22, 20 rather, on general provisions, that the Federal Republic may not be sued without its consent. Further, the Bill of Rights diminishes the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effect against unreasonable searches and seizures. It now authorizes, in addition to the search warrant, a so-called surveillance warrant. The Bill of Rights also reduces freedom of religion by limiting religious beliefs to only the fundamental ones, even though it expands it to include the freedom to reject religion. The expansion is meaningless. To one who has no religion, freedom of religion means nothing. The CCCOM creates an elitist democracy, an element that in itself weakens democracy, which could easily be pampered and strengthened by old and new political dynasties in the new 18 federated regions. The new provisions on regulations and control of political parties and the very narrow concept of political dynasties, very narrow because it's only up to the second degree, would in fact be the prescriptions for political elitism. The poor will have no chance for political leadership against these political parties. The poor will remain under the catches of politicians. The democracy fund would only be screened to cover elitism. More elitist is the requirement in Section 4C of Article 8 that the president and the vice president shall be elected as a team. A vote for the president shall be counted for the candidate for vice president. It follows then 
that a vote for the running mate vice president will not be counted as a vote for the candidate for president. The requirement prevents one from running either as president or vice president as an independent candidate. The candidate for president may choose who his or her vice presidential candidate. Then two, you have the requirement of college degrees or its equivalents for one running for president, vice president, senators, and representatives in the federal Congress. Those uh, without, that, without those degrees because of poverty or another other cause would have no chance of being elected as such. This is undemocratic and even anti-poor. Yet we would never have the assurance that the college degree holder would be a good president, vice president, senator, or representative. We had a president who was a brilliant lawyer, Bartlett Matzer, yet his regime was one of corruption, oppression, and injustice under Marcelo, the worst ever for our country. He was ousted by the People Power Revolt and brought to Hawaii, which he thought was Hawaii, but whose remains were allowed by the Supreme Court to be buried at the Libigan Namangupayani. We had a president who was a holder of a master's degree in economics, but who was pros uh, prosecuted for graft and corruption and plunder, was arrested and detained in the hospital, but, after, but thereafter was absolved by the same Supreme Court. On the other hand, no college degree requirement is imposed for candidates for the legislative and executive organs of the federated regions. It is enough that they know how to read and write. This, of course, is very democratic and pro poor. To me, wisdom and great values and virtues are not reserved for college graduates. Before, on the basis alone of the drafts of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of the Philippines, I denounce as one of the evils of federalism the creation of a horribly bloated and enlarged bureaucracy because of the, horribly, because of the creation of states or regional governments between the central government and the local government units under the present setup. The CCCOM has made it worse. It creates a horribly horrendous, bloated, and enlarged bureaucracy which principally results from the massive of our holding or structuring or surgery of the judiciary, not include the others. And now, let us take a look at the massive restructuring of, or surgery of the judiciary. Probably it could have been due to the fact that about two-thirds of the members of the consultative uh, committee are lawyers. As thus overhauled, the federal highest courts are created, namely Federal Supreme Court, Federal Constitutional Court, Federal Administrative Court, and the Federal Electoral, uh, Electoral Court. Each will be composed of a chief justice and eight associate justices. Then there will be 18 Federal Court of Appeals with one in each federated state, region. 18 regional Supreme Courts with one in each federated region. As many regional courts of appeals in each region as the regional assembly in each shall establish. Federal trial courts in each component city and province in each federated region. As many regional trial courts in each federated regions as the regional assembly in that region shall determine. Nothing, however, is mentioned of the existing Court of Appeals, the Sandigan Bayan, the Court of Appeals, and the present first and second level courts. Thus, under the CONCOM, the CCCOM, at any given time and simultaneously, there will be four chief justices, one each in the four highest federal courts, 18 chief justices in the, federal uh, in the federated regions, 32 associate justices 
in the four highest federal courts, 18 associate justices of the federal courts uh, of appeals, one each for every region, and as many associate justices in the regional court of appeals as may be fixed by the regional assembly. <clears throat> the creation of the federal constitutional court, federal administrative court, and federal electoral court is unnecessary and would only complicate our justice system and diminishes and weakens the historic dignity of the single highest court, the Supreme Court. It shall now be composed of only a chief justice and eight associate justices appointed for a term of 12 years with 70 as the mandatory age of retirement. The process of their appointment is most unusual, unusual and would seriously affect the independence of the court and would subject it to political pressures and interferences. Take note that of the nine members of the court, the Chief Justice and two associate justices shall be appointed by the President, three by the Commission on Appointments, and three by the Federal Constitutional Court. On the other hand, the Chief Justice and two associate justices of the Federal Supreme Court shall be appointed by the President, three by the Commission on Appointments, and three by the Federal Supreme Court. Political interference and pressures would be unavoidable because the President and the members of the Commission on Appointments uh, are politicians. In addition, removal of the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices for every impeachable offense would be far easier. Under the Consultative Committee Constitution, a joint impeachment committee headed by the President of the Senate and to each from the Federal Senate and House of Representatives is created. A complaint for impeachment against the Chief Justice and associate justices shall be filed with the committee, which shall determine whether the complaint is sufficient in form and substance. Thereafter, it will determine if a probable cause exists. If there is, it will prepare the articles of impeachment, which shall then be filed with the Federal Constitutional Court. This court has the exclusive authority to try and decide a case. A vote of six members of the Federal Constitutional Court would be necessary to convict the respondent. If impeachment is against the Chief Justice and Associate Justices of the Federal Supreme Court, Constitutional Court, the Federal Administrative Court will have jurisdiction to try and decide the case. In light of the Covalanto decision of the Supreme Court, in the Covalanto case against former Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Pesareno, the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court may still be ousted from office via Covaranto. In addition to, to this uh, bureaucracy, we have uh, six constitutional commissions uh, which are also created, namely civil service, election, audit, Human Rights, Ombudsman, and uh, uh, the Competition Commission. There are other two commissions not constitutional, which are not designated as constitutional. They are the Intergovernmental Commission and the Transitory Commission. To complete the picture of this horribly horrendous, bloated, and enlarged bureaucracy, the CCCOM establishes a federal congress composed of the Senate with 36 senators, two from each uh, uh, federated region, and House representatives, that was mentioned earlier, uh, to consist of uh, 400, not more than 400, the 60 of which shall come from the legislative districts and 40 from political parties who are voted nationwide. The party system is abolished. In each federated region, there will be a regional assembly, one half of whose members shall come from each province, highly urbanized cities, and the other half from political parties throughout through proportionate representation. This should also be the executive headed by the regional governor with a deputy governor who will be presiding officer of the regional assembly. The regional governor and deputy governor shall also be elected as a team. Thousands of offices will have to be created in the reorganized and the structured judiciary in the federal constitutional and non-constitutional commissions in the federal congress and in the regional assembly 
and regional executive in each of the federated regions. How can this horribly, horrendous, bloated, and enlarged bureaucracy be maintained? Only by the imposition of taxes, which the people will be forced to bear. Thus, uh, the federalism proposed by the CCCOM must be rejected because of the evils it breeds. And there are so many evils. I have enumerated these evils the last time that they appeared here, and probably I will not tire anymore the, uh, the uh, distinguished uh, members of the committee. Uh, I may just say that uh, under the setup, the poor will become poorer and the rich richer. It will be an obstacle to the pursuit and practice of good governance, accountability, and transparency. This kind of bureaucracy cannot promote the public trust character of a public office, which lies at the heart of public service, as mandated by Section 1 of Article 11 of our Constitution. Then, I wish you not forget, it will promote massive graft and corruption because the creation of thousands of new positions could increase the breeding grounds for graft and corruption, such as positions involved in infrastructure projects, in the grant of concessions or permits, or in the collection of taxes. Your Honours, our people cannot tolerate this. So, not to charter change, not to federalism, God bless the Philippines. God bless the Filipino people. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice Davide. Um, Senator Baum had to leave, but he requested uh, this uh, chairman to, with the permission of our colleagues, a uh, very quick question to the uh, CONCOM.